Hello my beautiful co-creators, Lilu here on the Juicy Living Tour, a magnificent 12 months tour across the world meeting incredible people like this wonderful man I have by my side which is Richard Tarnas, the famous Richard Tarnas. <laughs> we were introduced uh, uh, by actually Dr. Grove that really loves your work, admires your work. Can you As tell I us? love his uh, and admire his very much. Mm, can you tell us more, because you wrote many books, um, but I would just really love you to introduce yourself because you, it's a, it's a, astrology is a passion of yours, but you're also a professor in psychology. Yeah, professor of psychology and philosophy. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, well, I, I met uh, Dr. Groff back in 1974 at Esalen Institute, which was kind of the uh, mother church of the human potential movement, new paradigm, thinking and, and uh, the East-West encounter and so forth. Uh, this is a place in Big Sur, California. And he, Stan Groff, was the scholar in residence. I was working on my PhD at that point. And, uh, and I ended up living there for um, over a decade and also so did Stan. Uh, and it was while we were there that we started doing, um, noticing that there were correlations between the movements of the planets and the qualities of human experience. We were particularly mm -hmm. studying um, the uh, non-ordinary states of consciousness. Um, you know, Stan Groff had been uh, and still is really the world's leading um, psychiatrist working with LSD uh, therapy. And, and <clears throat> in those years, he had moved to Esalen to write up his uh, research, and we were still working with the problem of how do we understand how people who uh, have the same, are, are taking the same substance, same dosage, have such radically different experiences, or the same person could have to very different experiences at different times. None of the standard psychological tests had any uh, predictive uh, value, it, and what we discovered, this mm -hmm. was following uh, suggestions by uh, Carl Gustav Jung, the, uh, the Swiss psychologist, um, who had had a lot of interest in astrology and had pursued that research for years and, and wrote about it. That gave us a sense that there might be something to look there, and so we did, and we were quite astonished to find that <clears throat> there were, in fact, um, very consistent correspondences between uh, the qualities of experience that somebody would have at a given time and where the planets were in the sky in relationship to their horoscope or their, their birth chart, mm -hmm. uh, which is where the planets were when they were born. That uh, really surprised us because we both were educated in a cosmology, a, a worldview in which astrology is completely um, negated. It's, it's, it's a superstition. Mm -hmm. In many ways, astrology is uh, what we would say in English uh, is the gold standard of superstition mm. in our culture. Mm. Um, so we were very surprised to find that it had any uh, validity at all. And so we studied it first very closely with the um, individual therapeutic process and spiritual emergencies and people were going through dramatic uh, transformations psychologically. But then Having seen those correspondences, I started doing research for larger uh, number of like famous public uh, cultural figures. Like I'd look and see, well, what, what, uh, where were the planets at the time that uh, Rene Descartes uh, uh, wrote the um, Discourse on Method? You know the. Uh, cogito ergo sum, you know, or when, or what what transits, what planetary transits did Galileo have when he first turned the te telescope to the heavens and a whole new cosmos opened up to him. Uh, so I just started looking very systematically at that and, and was just mm. quite 
astonished by the um, correlations. So th the two books that I've written, yeah. this one here is more, uh, this is The Passion of the Western Mind. This is a history of, of Western thought, you know, from Socrates and Plato and the ancient Greeks up to the postmodern period. Mm -hmm. um, and this is used in um, like a lot of universities, not, not in France though, but in, uh, in uh, the United States and uh, the uh, UK and also Latin America um, <coughs> and uh, some Asian countries. And then 20 years later, so I wrote that in 1991, right, in the 1980s, I finished that in 1991. This one uh, I published in 2006 in Cosmos and Psyche. Uh, this is the um, this is the work that sets out the planetary correlations with uh, our our world history. Um, so, in a way, one is esoteric, mm -hmm. astrological. The other one is more um, mainstream, traditional uh, history. Uh, of philosophy. Mm. So you said just earlier that there's a certain alignment of planet that allows us to be, to 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 have this connection to the cosmos and this kind of opening in one's life all of a sudden. Like you can really read that by the planet aligning mm. in a certain way. Well, the the idea is that we found certain consistent patterns yeah. where particular planets would tend to be lined up with a pers person's horoscope or birth chart. Um, at the time that they were having uh, major breakthroughs, uh, also crises too, or you know, there, it wasn't only one type of experience, d depending on which planets were involved, and also on factors that didn't have anything to do with astrology, but on what a person's um, background was or mm -hmm. what their um, uh, um, circumstances were. But we, what we noticed was that the planetary alignments seem to be archetypally predictive, mm -hmm. not not concretely predictive. Like it didn't tell us, like you couldn't look at somebody's uh, transits and say, oh, you're going to you know, fall in love on July 15th, uh, 2012 um, on a beach in Hawaii mm -hmm. uh, with a you know, particular person. But what you could see is during a certain period of time, there'll be a, um, a certain quality of experience that could involve, let's say, the opening of horizons to new relationships or new, uh, or, or also aesthetic experience, uh, or uh, could, could be um, a certain new sense of beauty or even falling in love with nature or something like that. You couldn't, you can't just look at the chart and say, um, what the concrete specific, you get more of a general archetypal um, flavor or quality, and then depending on other factors that could be, you know, biographical specifics uh, and cu what culture it's happening in. Like a woman who's born in Afghanistan has much different potential uh, for actualizing what is in her birth chart than a woman born in Paris or, or Copenhagen or San Francisco. Um, so it's as if the larger circumstances that we're in shape the ways in which these archetypal principles come through. Mm -hmm. Also, one person could, could have an, a breakthrough turning the telescope to the heavens. Another person has a breakthrough from uh, having a spiritual awakening that would be more specifically religious. So what are some of those archetypical uh, archetypes for spiritual awakening, for example? Is well, there some that... Yeah, yes, I mean, what, what we see uh, most consistently for spiritual awakenings is um, there will be, uh, like generally, the, the planet uh, uh, Uranus, uh, how, how would you say it in French? Uranus. Uh, Uranus uh, um, would, uh, that tends to be the planetary, uh, the planet that is transiting um, people's charts at the time of various kinds of sudden changes, awakenings, breakthroughs, uh, and depending on what it's touching in the chart, it could be more 
romantic or it could be more intellectual or it could be more um, spiritual. Uh, the spiritual ones often seem to have the presence of uh, Neptune. Um, Water. Uh, well, no. Nep yeah, I mean, ne Neptune is, as, a, as an archetype, does have something to do with, with water and the, the, in a sense, archetypally, it's like the, the divine ocean of consciousness, uh, yeah. um, the, the um, realm of the spiritual, the imaginative, the intangible uh, poetic dimension of, of prose existence, okay? Like the prose part of life is, is what Saturn rules, the, the concrete table here or the um, Newtonian Cartesian world. That's more Saturn, while Neptune represents, if Saturn is the prose, or, then Neptune is the poetry. Yeah. If, if Saturn represents the, the, the facts in a kind of concrete way, Neptune represents the spiritual, um, intangible dimension of everything that is in the material world. Okay, so it's usually those two, usually Ur Uranus and Neptune are usually uh, factors uh, in spiritual awakenings. And when those two planets come into major alignment for the whole world, yeah. like where they come into conjunction uh -huh. in a world transit or, or opposition, the, which is like the new moon or the full moon, uh, only it's these two planets, we see uh, 10 or 15 year periods of major spiritual awakenings, births of new religions tend to happen historically. Like the birth of Christianity, the birth of uh, Islam, the, uh, it also can be like cu cultural renaissances and um, um, periods of kind of paradigm shifts of one's, of the cultural vision. But very consistently you see uh, sp really like waves of new uh, spiritual and uh, religious uh, impulses will come into a culture and, and globally at the time of, of those Uranus and Neptune um, alignments. I, I give about uh, 70 pages of the tracing going back to the, the, the axial period when um, the, the 6th century BC or BCE which is when you know, the beginning of uh, like Buddhism, when, when mm -hmm. Buddha lived and when uh, the uh, beginning of Taoism and Lao Tzu and when the great Hebrew prophets, uh, Isaiah and Ezekiel were uh, sh reshaping the Jewish faith and when um, at the same time uh, in India, Mahavira was beginning Jainism and at the same time in Greece, Pythagoras and Thales were beginning uh, Greek philosophy. So right across the uh, major civilizations, uh, there was a simultaneous awakening. And this is happening too right now, because I just heard that there's an end of a cycle, of a Uranus cycle actually ending on in tomorrow, is that true? On March, on February Oh, that's a much, 11th? that's different. That's um, different, huh? Yeah, that's, uh, Uranus is, leaving the uh, tropical sign of uh, Pisces, uh, the fish, uh, yeah. and moving into Aries. Okay. But that is, that, that's a, sh a short cycle. I mean, it moves through that uh, ev every 84 years. It goes all the way around, uh -huh. and uh, it only takes uh, a approximately, um, you know, uh, eight years to go through a... Um, yeah, to go through a, a particular sign. But, but is that spiritual years. awakening that you're talking about on a world level, are we approaching it too as, as we're just ending one of those 84-year-old cycle? Is that, are we close to it on a world level for something big happening? I mean, what are well, you seeing in okay. your forecast for yeah. this year and beyond? Well, Ur Ur Uranus has already moved into Aries once earlier last year, and then it moved retrograde, and then going forward, this is... Uh, Getting a little technical there. Well, exactly. It's what's called retrograde movement. It's because, of course, the Earth is moving, Uranus is moving. They're both moving around the sun, mm -hmm. and so you uh, get a com complications in, in the movements of the apparent movements of the planets. But to make a long story short, yes, I think, I mean, generally what we found, this is um, the, 
there's a group now here in the San Francisco Bay Area of about 70 or 80 uh, researchers, uh, many of whom come, have come out of this school, California Institute of Integral Studies. Um, and we've uh, founded a, 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 a large group uh, called the Archetypal uh, Research Collective. It's about 70 or 80 people. There's a journal called the, Jour the Archi Journal of Archetypal Cosmology that you can access online, spelled A-R-C-H-A-I, archai, the Greek word, archaijournal.org. And um, so we've been doing that research uh, for you know, 20, 30 years at this point. And what we found is that the signs, like Aries or Pisces, they, do see, they, they're, they are significant. They seem to color the energy, but the they're not as significant as the the big the alignments like of the planets, like the conjunction of two planets or the opposition. Um, and what we're finding right now is we are right now in a huge, a very important um, world transit mm -hmm. that involves bringing uh, in which um, actually four different planets of four out of the outer five planets. Uh, have come into a, a configuration that's called a T-square. Two planets are in opposition, and uh, uh, a, a third one is, is in a, like that. Mm -hmm. And then it happens that this year, a fourth one is conjoining Uranus. So Jupiter and Uranus are here. What we find is that those alignments are where the action is. That's that was much more important to know, for example, that Pluto or Saturn or Uranus was conjoining your moon at the time that you were doing a, uh, having an experience like um, a holotropic breath work or LSD or uh, sh shamanic ritual in South America. It was much more important to know that the planet was um, forming a conjunction or an opposition to part something in your birth chart like your sun or your moon or your your um, Jupiter or something like that much more important than what sign it was in which would be like Aries or Gemini the Aries or the Gemini the Scorpio those color the energy um, but they don't have the same dynamic uh, uh, significance that the alignments do. And what we're getting right now is this lineup where, uh, I won't get too te technical, but um, basically... Some people enjoy that too. <laughs> well, the, you know, basically two of the planets have come into uh, an alignment for the first time since the 1960s. So from 1960 to 1972, uh, Uranus and, and Pluto were in conjunction. Uh, and during those years of the 1960s, early 1970s, we saw really a whole, the whole world go through the, this kind of radical breakthrough, sudden change mm -hmm. in every part of human experience. Um, politics, psychology, the sexual revolution, um, independence movements, civil rights movements, women's feminist movement, uh, the, uh, ecology, uh, psychedelic revolution, many, many things were happening. Rock and roll, mm -hmm. Paris in, in 1968 was uh, happening May of 68 in the same way we had here in Berkeley and in uh, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts or New York, uh, San Francisco, but all around the world. Uh, radical changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rolling Stones had that song, Everywhere I Hear the Sound of Marching, Charging Feet. Uh, and that's what we have again now. The, those two planets have moved into the next um, alignment uh, uh, called the square since the 60s. And that will go from roughly 2007 to 2020 for another 10 years, another decade or another nine years. Hmm. And um, so astrologers who've been studying this have n felt for uh, uh, quite a while that we were going to see a a period where um, there would be a lot more revolutionary energy in the uh, in the air, people on the streets. Uh, there'd be more uh, women would start becoming more empowered. Also, typically, 
youth, uh, young people becoming politically active and mm. rebellious, very typical. Um, you know, another period like this of Uranus and Pluto was the uh, 1787 to 1798 period when the French Revolution mm -hmm. happened. Um, and in fact, right when, in 1789, um, when the Bastille, uh, of course, happened, that's when Jupiter, which tends to s bring about more expansive uh, uh, success to whatever it's lining up with, Jupiter came into this alignment with the revolutionary energy energies of Uranus and the Pluto, and that was right when that only lasts for about a year, and that's right when the Bastille happened and the Egyptian uh, and w w uh, the case in both I Egypt and in uh, Tunisia mm -hmm. um, happened right with when those three planets, Jupiter, Uranus, and Pluto, were all lined up again. Mm. Now, one quick thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to give the impression that there is a um, kind of mechanistic causal uh, relationship between the planets being here and human beings having these experiences. Uh, it's, it's more like, um, it's not like a kind of Newtonian gravity or a electric electromagnetic ra radiation or something like that coming from the planets and making things happen, like a billiard ball hitting another billiard ball. It's not like that. It's we also have free will, right? I mean, we have the, 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 the opportunity to choose very and to much. respond to this energy in certain ways. E exactly, and, and uh, one of the reasons that I believe the, that human freedom uh, has a, um, a purchase uh, within this co astrological cosmos is that um, <clears throat> we're not looking at forces that are like material, linear, causal forces. They're more like, um, they're, they're like, uh, they're archetypal energies that can express themselves in different ways. So uh, you can have, in one country, the same energies can come through as violent revolution. In another country, it can come through uh, as a more, um, uh, peaceful, uh, peaceful, self-disciplined um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, expression of the same impulse for radical change, but with a different um, concrete uh, character. Mm. Um, same thing, you know, in a, in a private individual uh, way. Um, you, uh, a, a person might have a transit that tends towards uh, let's say some kind of separation or moving towards a, a feeling like one needs to be uh, breaking away from a confining structure mm -hmm. in order to be free. Well, for one person that might result in a very difficult divorce, but another person could work out a different type of, uh, like a new sense of uh, mutual, mutual supported, mutually supported freedom within a relationship, for example, um, and just knowing where the planets are doesn't tell you, oh, this is going to be a divorce, or this is going to be a, um, a you know, a, a violent revolution or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's there's always the potential for human freedom uh, to play a role in how it comes through. So it seems like, as an astrologer or astrologist around the world, really tap into their intuition. Also, it's a big part of the of yeah. understanding and of interpreting, isn't it? Like the biggest astrologer are probably the most intuitive ones? Well, certainly the intuition is, <coughs> is, is, is helpful, but it's not uh, only, th there it's also is, th it's a balance because one has to study carefully the yeah. patterns and see, well, what really has happened each time? Mm. Um, so you see a consistent pattern mm -hmm. and then you can say, okay, here they're coming again, these planets. Mm -hmm. um, we notice there's been a pattern of revolutionary um, uh, decades that have coincided with this uh, alignment. Um, and then we could, and so, for example, I wrote in here, bef m you know, quite a f six years ago now, uh, 2005 is when I wrote the section talking about the current period. And I said, you know, you'll, we'll typically see the um, women being uh, more empowered uh, during this period, 
the activation of youth uh, becoming more uh, politically, socially uh, active. Um, the environmental movement typically has been more uh, empowered, <clears throat> but there's also a tendency towards greater, uh, uh, oh, because Saturn came into the T-square, I said this particular period of 2008 to 2011 tends to be a period when there's financial crises, um, mm -hmm. stock market breakdown, that type of thing. I, uh, as we see in the last time those three planets came into the T-square with Saturn um, was uh, 1929 to 1933, which was a period of great economic crisis and so mm -hmm. forth. So, um, so it's studying the history at yeah. the same time. Uh, it's very science. It's very a holistic discipline. Huh? That's right. I mean, so there is a, a a a kind of you know very scientific, careful, methodical observation, but uh, you have to have an eye, what James Hillman calls an archetypal eye, or Hillman or, or uh, Jung would speak of it as like a capacity for symbolic discernment, mm -hmm. where you can. You can see symbolic patterning, um, and you can see the similarity between uh, a person having a, uh, a between the person who turns the telescope to the heavens, like Galileo, and another person having um, under the same transit having uh, the br a uh, beginning a civil rights movement in, in the United States uh, or or women's movement like Betty Friedan. Um, you can't, so what is the similarity there? Well, it's the archetypal kind of Promethean principle of the, the breakthrough, the change, the radical, the rebellion against the oppressive uh, limitation of the status quo, so. But it's interesting, what, because yesterday we were sitting in your class here and, uh, and you talked about uh, what's happening this summer. Some, something, some important dates are ahead and there is, it can, it can turn out in many different ways right. again. There's both sides here. It could turn into rebellion, yes. uh, major rebellions, or it can turn out into some huge peace movement or some huge in new initiatives. Well, what I was talking about there was, <coughs> really it's a continuation of what's happening right now. Yeah. It's just that the planets will be moving into a, a tighter uh, um, alignment this summer. Uh -huh. um, but it's already happening uh, and and has been going on, this T-square has been going on really very strongly since 2008. Uh -huh. uh, but this summer it comes through for a, f a final close pass. And what I was pointing out is that <clears throat> depending on how th the human community and individual countries uh, enact these um, energies, we could see either a tendency towards a more a sense of progress towards uh, freedom and democracy. That's very. That's one very typical possibility. Uh, but another is a tendency towards uh, chaos, towards a social political turmoil and ferment that can that can be uh, violently chaotic. Um, like nine eleven, you were saying that was the last time this transit. Came well, around? that 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 was <laughs> that was one of the. See, right now there's four planets involved. That one in in uh, nine eleven, two of the planets, Saturn and Pluto, were in opposition, and so that particular cycle is also happening now. So there is some tendency towards. Um, uh, like fundamentalist or reactionary empowerment, conservative empowerment. Uh, Tyrannism? Uh, more tyrannical. Uh, uh, and, and so I was mentioning you have both the potential for strong democratizing m uh, movements towards freedom, but also the empowerment of reactionary and conservative uh, or even or fundamentalist uh, forces. And so you get often a balance between the rebellion and then a crackdown, rebellion, crackdown. And uh, it differs from country to country uh, as to how things will come out. I mean, even in Egypt, it's different now than it was last month. You Is know. that depending also on the reaction and how people are going to react? Very and much. And it then it, does that influence the whole planet? And then you have to rebirth <laughs> another chart? I mean, how does this, how does no, the dynamic work out? Well, the pl it doesn't change the planet's right. positions, yeah. but 
what happens is the archetypal forces that are associated with the planets, mm -hmm. when they come through us in a particular way, then uh, that will shape the, the, the future uh, so that the next person that comes into that field has new opportunities that would be different than if uh, the people before them had mm -hmm. uh, actualized or enacted that archetypal energy in some other way. Mm -hmm. Because there's a kind of collective unconscious that is constantly, that we're all participating in. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of world soul that we're all, you know, anima mundi, that we're all embedded in and we all are participating in and how you act in your life shapes how other people uh, respond to those energies, even if they don't know about what you did, because we're all interconnected. There's like a, in, in one field. There's like one, one field that we're all, uh, that it unites us all, ev even if you don't, aren't, aren't getting on the telephone and telling people, this is what I did. It still ripples out into the um, kind of uh, psychic uh, f field, or what uh, Irvin Lasso would talk about as like the uh, the A field or the Akashic field that we all hmm. that kind of uh, or an anima. I think of it as the Latin words anima mundi, the soul of the world, which is another way of saying Jung's collective psyche or collective unconscious. It's very interesting the dynamic between our creation and what's already written and all of yeah. that. I guess it's a big part of yeah, what you must have discovered in depth too during your work. It, it it's been an important part and because it, it makes the ideas of somebody like Jung or like Stan Groff uh, or like uh, Whitehead uh, uh, or or Bergson, um, it it gives those ideas new. Um, uh, illustration so we see oh yeah that's how it works mm -hmm. and it also I think empowers us to have a sense of responsibility for the whole mm -hmm. and for the future because what I'm doing in my life isn't just my private affair um, it's gonna ripple out to yeah. the future and for other people uh, and so we're all in it together and it's time for us to get that um, I was going to ask you, uh, so what are the, um, there's new planets that are being discovered too all the time, isn't there? I mean, is, is astrology well, particularly evolved? These last, yeah, these, particularly these Tell last about 15 that years. And how that has impacted astrology in general. Well, um, first of all, the discovery of Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto in the uh, 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, those were, those were big yeah. N unexpected new discoveries and astrologers studied very carefully you know what tended to happen when those planets were in alignment with a person's chart or when they were you know in uh, prominent in their horoscope and after decades of close observation uh, th there uh, came to be a consensus about their meanings and right now among uh, modern astrologers, um, there's there's a complete consensus about the meanings for those three planets, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. But the planets that have been uh, discovered in in the last uh, 15 years, yeah. uh, we are just starting that research. We, we don't have enough of a database to m have conclusions about their meanings. So we're, st we're still... What are some of them? Can you tell us their names? Well, like Sedna is one and um, Eris is another, E-R-I-S. Um, those, those are two of the m uh, most important uh, ones. Yeah. <coughs> They're part of a whole trans-Neptunian uh, belt called the uh, uh, Kuiper Belt, and um, Pluto is one of those outer, um, outermost planets. I think, in a way, what those discoveries mean already we can see is that they're opening up our sense of these of the mm. solar system to a more galactic yeah. um, uh, to 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 the larger galactic field that we're that our solar system is embedded in 
and instead of being, you know, it used to be that everything was enclosed within Saturn. Saturn was the outermost planet known to the ancients up until the telescope was discovered and then 1781 when William Herschel discovered Uranus. But up until then, everyone thought Saturn was the furthest planet and then after that it was the, the fixed stars were much further out. Well, now we have had Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Uh, that opened up the, cos the solar system much more and these n most recent discoveries are starting to, in a way, um, move, dissolve the boundary line uh -huh. between the, the limits of the, so the boundaries of the s solar system and the, and the larger galaxy that we are part of. And therefore of ourselves too. I think so. I think it's, I think it's moving us, just as Stan Groff's work uh, m uh, moves our sense of the human psyche from being a more individual, um, uh, you know, like skin encapsulated ego, to yeah. use Alan Watts's term, uh, and moves it into a, you know, really a kind of cosmic psyche. Like, like the whole cosmos is inside each of us, um, and we are continuous with the cosmos. It's we're not. Well, just as so, just as Stan Groff's psychology opens up consciousness and each of our own individual consciousness to the whole um, in some sense these new planetary discoveries uh, astronomical discoveries are opening up our our local cosmic ego of the solar system to to a larger Universal. galactic and yeah. cosmic uh, consciousness in some sense mm. And you see also in your uh, own work the, the, the 20th, 1st of December 2012, is that also something that you find there as a major date? Uh, not As the Maya do or not? I, there's nothing um, especially significant by the, uh, from the observations of, of past um, planetary alignments that point towards that date. But um, I think 2012, 2012 has become a kind of symbol uh, of a widespread sense in the human community that we are at a threshold of deep transformation. And uh, the Mayans, and of course there's some controversy about different you know, interpretations of the Mayan uh, uh, astronomy and Mayan prophecies, but <coughs> the fact that the there are a number of prophetic traditions that do point towards something around this period is worth paying attention to. I mean, it's some kind of a, the human intuition is, is working at something. And even apart from being a prophet or a clairvoyant, you, don't ha you can see just with your eyes open that the earth community is at a turning point and uh, I personally doubt that, you know, that particular date in December of 2012 is going to be, you know, totally like a light switch going off or <laughs> on or anything like, th just like that. But, but it's like over a period of time. That's right, over a, uh, over a longer period of time. Clearly, we are in a time of uh, profound uh, transformation. And I think that, um, uh, the work that uh, many of the people that you've been interviewing uh, represent a uh, a kind of preparation for us to be able to undergo that transformation more intelligently and more uh, uh, creatively, so in a more life-enhancing way. Mm. Did you get ever interested through your studies about other lives and other planets? Is that did you came across that? Um, well, I certainly am interested in the whole idea of, of karma and reincarnation, uh -huh. um, which uh, perhaps Stan Groff might have talked to you about the, the, the results of consciousness research and so forth. But um, I don't personally have any, uh, I don't know, the, the life on, on this earth is already exciting enough to me. <laughs> yeah. So. Very, well. very good. This is this was awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I know you're a busy, busy man. Thank you. Unfortunately, really I have appreciate me meetings that. and lectures to go to. But this I, was uh, awesome. Well, I've enjoyed uh, having my conversation with you. Thank and, you. And uh, I hope that uh, your 
your work uh, and all these interviews are able to reach a, a, a large uh, audience that can uh, that would be interested and will will uh, receive it. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for your time. Much love, my beautiful.